G'day Aussie Gridiron fans, you're listening to the Aussie Gridiron Network, Australia's home of NFL and Gridiron content, and this is the G'day Gridiron podcast. We've made it past week four in the NFL season, a quarter of the way over there already, and we're back tonight with all the overreactions and storylines from the week that was. Our regular cast is missing from the studio tonight though. But never fear, it's not just me by myself. Uh, Nick is deep in pre-season training with the Adelaide University Hogs for what will be a massive 2024-25 season in South Australia, whilst Brad has gone trekking deep into the Patagonian jungle in search of that one elusive playmaker the Cowboys need to finally get past that playoff hump and achieve greatness. So I've wrangled a pinch hitter in at the last minute. He is the brainchild behind the number one fantasy football show in the whole of this great southern land and one of the voices of the American Football ACT League. It's none other than Matty C. How are you going, mate? Wow, I just had to do a quick look behind me to make sure you weren't talking about somebody else because this was starting to actually sound really impressive. I'm like, well, I'm not the guest then. Who else you got on here that I can't see? But th- thank you. Very gracious of you, Ian, to say so many nice things about me, mate. And great to be working with you again. We haven't worked together since uh, the preseason on the fantasy show. So it's, it's just good to be back in your company, mate. Yeah, it's good to have you here, mate. And it, you've got to, Thanks, mate. as a host, you've got to build up your guest. You can't just break them down straight away. No, hundred percent. There's no fun tearing down something that's at ground level. You got to you got to make sure it's at, at a level that's worthy of being torn down. I do this to Taylor all the time, as you know. <laughs> Absolutely, I know that. Uh, of course, so we are back today to do week four overreactions. Have a, a look through the mailbag, which we've got a few little letters in there for, and uh, of course the second week of. G'day AI, the top five storylines from week four, according to AI, our lord, saviour and overlord AI. Uh, (laughs) We all worship the AI around here. So, Maddie's going to help me out with a whole bunch of overreactions. Well, a few anyway, because there's some big ones from the week that's just gone, because it was an insane week of football. Um, Many, many big scores. Such great games we've just been watching. Great. This has been a great season so far, Matty. It has definitely been a season of the unexpected. And I keep thinking this. I get to about this stage each year and I go, yeah, but I was saying the exact same thing last year, where a team that you expect to be hot out of the gate starts slow. And uh, somebody who was kind of maybe left for dead or potentially a bit washed up just kind of shows that they've still got a little something. And... It happens every year. We've just got such short memories. And, yeah, I, I guess it's just the who those surprises are is what changes. It's never that things don't, you know, sort of turn out the way you expect. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, there's definitely – it's been a good season, though. I, I've enjoyed the games. So. I mean, um, so I'm a Jags fan as well. So, full disclosure here, everybody. I am somebody who <laughs> – I profess to like football more than my team, really, because, you know, my team's not so successful. So, it gives me the freedom to enjoy the football and not be blinded by, you know, just passion for a set of laundry like some of these San Francisco guys do. But, shots at them aside um, – <laughs> It, it's been a difficult season to watch my side lose to... They've played four playoff teams out of the gate. They've lost three of those games by one score and got blown the hell out of the water in the other one. No excuses. But it's made it really easy to sit back and enjoy the, the interesting things going on around the league. I, yeah. I mean, I, I've been saying the same for a while, but I've been trying to temper expectations this season, yep. of course, because the Vikings are at 4-0 and now. So it's like, just let's just keep... Keep it all. Keep a lid on it. Let's just keep a lid on it because the last time we got to five and zero, we still missed playoffs. So 
Let's mm-hmm. just keep those expectations way down. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's starting to look like 2016 all over again, and I think we want to avoid 2016 all over again. To oh be my honest, God. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just it is what it is. It's just it's fun to watch a football game and have something exciting that's positive for your team. Uh, it, it's considered that it's been weeks in the last couple of years where I've wanted to throw my phone across the room when I'm watching at work or something like that or or like I'll, I'll finish the game and I have to tap out of football for the rest of the day because I'm just done. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> familiar. Yeah, like, you know, hands up if that's familiar. Yeah, over here. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this week just gone was one of those where I felt like, and Miami in week one, where I felt like, oh, we, we've we got ourselves to a spot where we should, we're in control of this and we, we should, all things being equal, probably walk away with this win and then... And both of them bit us right on soft parts that aren't comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Matty, how about we uh, play a drop to start the overreaction segment? I've lined up something a bit more interesting from uh, the week that was. Here we go. Thanks. Oh, what's up, Bells? A couple things we said last night, man. We said uh, it's great when you count on others and they f- count on you. And that way, mm-hmm. victory is produced by... F- Everybody, all right? And that's what tonight was, man. Fast, physical. We said anybody, anywhere, any motherfucking time. Right? So we did what we came to do, all right? So uh, there'll be a number of game balls uh, that we'll be uh, issuing out, I'm sure, tomorrow. But there's one motherfucker that ain't leaving this city without one. Cliff! Yes, of course. That is the voice of Dan Quinn, head coach of the Washington Commanders. Uh Heaping praise on none other than Cliff Kingsbury, who was run out of Arizona, uh, unceremoniously run out of Arizona, coming back to the Cardinals against to play against them uh, with the Commanders and Jaden Daniels and absolutely demolishing the Cardinals. A game that we all thought was going to be very offensive, Matty, and just like all scores on both sides, like 80-plus as total scores. Yeah. Uh, and in the end... The Commanders won 42-14, to 14, putting themselves firmly at the top of the NFC East and absolute favourites now to win the NFC East. Wow. Well, I mean, I definitely get that people are going to get all in this, like, three-on-one train and they're going to feel really happy and positive about the direction of the Commanders. The, the things we know about the Commanders is still, their defence is still balls. Uh, they've got ways to score, which we didn't think they were going to, which I love, right? I'm a wide receiver in my days from when I played. Fantasy is my thing, so so points. I love points, but I, I feel like we're very quick to dismiss there's, there's teams with a bit of pedigree and prestige in the division who have got off to slow starts, but I think it's, it would be a bit callous to disregard them outright. Um, and mainly I'm talking about Dallas in this instance that I think it's probably a little disrespectful to, to just brush Dallas away like they're nothing after winning the division 12 wins last year and knowing what their offense has got. Um, and, you know, that they, they haven't been firing on all cylinders, but it doesn't mean that they won't. And I don't know that there's actually more that Washington can do. I think what we're seeing here is the best you're going to get out of Washington before teams really start to to counteract what they're doing in a way that I think mm. Dallas are about to emerge. So I, I get why people are doing it. I get that you can say they're favorites because betting, that's probably right. But I think it's reckless. But the Browns, uh, sorry, the um, the Commanders have got a couple of interesting games coming up, though. Uh, Browns, Ravens, Panthers, Bears in the next four. So they very much could add to that uh, that three-win total. Yeah. Maybe more than that, uh, which will propel them a bit further up the, the table as, as such, but not necessarily NFC East table. I get what you're saying, though, Matty. The Cowboys are definitely poised at that point to just have a good run. Um, and just for things to click and just to come together as a team. Um, they have to, really, realistically. They have to. Otherwise, um, there's going to be a head coach well and truly on the hot seat. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Uh, and not, not that people aren't already talking about that. Yeah, you know, People are already right. worried about the McCarthy era there. Yeah. And then, of course, though, the, the Eagles, on the other hand, um, are, are in massive trouble. Uh, there's been calls yeah. for Sirianni's head for, for weeks now. Um, and... They just—they're not playing well. They're not playing like the, the Eagles. They're not doing—they're not doing the things to set up Jalen Hurts to play successfully every week like they had been in past. Um, you know, and and he's—he's he's missing throws. He's not 
making reads like he should be. They're in, they're in some real trouble at two and two. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think as two and two teams, they're not all made equal in Dallas and uh, Philadelphia are definitely examples of that in that I feel like a lot of hope for Dallas. And I'm, I'm not sure I can say the same for Philly. That said, I understand Philly. Uh, they've got two really great attacking receiving weapons that aren't there and they really haven't had the benefit of A.J. Brown pretty much all season. So, I mean, things should improve for them in that respect. But what has bothered me a bit is their defense was meant to be better than it is. No one thought yeah. the Cowboys' defense was going to be good. We just thought they'd outscore teams. Uh, we, we actually thought Philly could contain teams, and, and because they're not, that's actually a big problem that we didn't think they were going to have. And now compounded by the fact that you take away weapons that prevent them scoring, um, that, that to me is a bigger problem. And I mean, it's about the most Philly thing in the world to then go after this guy who took you to Super Bowl 15 minutes ago and go, oh, we've lost a couple of games now off with his head, right? Um, yeah. They did that to, well, pretty much everyone. Everyone who's been there and had any success, they've chased out of town. Doug Peterson and Chip Kelly um, were just, they, they were excellent coaches, and the minute there was any instability, they just chased him out of town with um, with pitchforks. So it's it's the Philly way, and I mean, unless Sirianni can win the majority of the next four, he's going to be gone. He's just going to be gone, because that's the Philly way. Yeah, and I, the way they are now, the way if they keep playing the way they are now, I feel like the Giants would be able to beat them, which is a outrageous thing to say. I mean, that is proper overreacting. Um, overreacting. Overreacting. I'll make, make sure I get that <laughs> drop in there. Yeah. That is absolutely overreacting. But, I mean, it's not... Oh, but is it? <laughs> it could, I know. The way the defense is playing, if you get a, a proper Daniel Jones, Malik Neighbors game, then they're going to destroy him through the air. So it's yeah. just how it is. How it is. Um, so... And that's them. Another team who should be on top, perennially on top, have been for the last couple of seasons and are going for that three-peat. Their hopes have been sort of really dashed this week after a what looks to be possibly a season-ending injury to Rasheed Rice. Uh, Of course, we are talking about the Chiefs for anyone that doesn't know. Uh, Rice now sidelined alongside other key players like Hollywood Brown and Isaiah Pacheco. Um, are are the Chiefs is the three peat over before it even began, Matty? Right, and I got overreacting. Overreacting. I got some questions to lead this one off. Uh, who in their division do you not trust them to beat as they are now? Even without a Rice replacement, even without Hollywood Brown, even without Pacheco for another month, who do you not trust them to beat? Yeah, I would have to. That right? that is the that is the big question because I mean they just played the Chargers and we to saw me, what the happened. toughest one on the road and they won it. Yeah, so they played the Chargers at home next time around. I actually and feel Char- pretty confident that no matter how they look, they'll probably be better than the Chargers. And Chargers fans could be be. It's fair to say they could be uh, that aggrieved with the fact that they should have won that game. To be fair, when it, early on. Uh, and they and managed to do they the most. Didn't. <laughs> they managed to do the most charges thing ever, and not bring a game home. And it doesn't matter. It shows yes. that it doesn't matter who you, who your coaching is if you still can't bring that game home. So, and and then the other things I'm like wonder is okay. So, and we would agree, Vegas and Denver shouldn't pose a massive threat to KC, and they they could really potentially walk away with five and one in the division without much difficulty. Today, even before they go and replace some of these parts or before Pacheco's back, if they had to play them all today, yep. home or away, we'd probably favour the Chiefs in five of the six, maybe six of the six games, right? Now it makes missing the playoffs difficult. And the longer the season goes, the more things like... The, I know that the Rashi Rice injury impacts this a lot, but the, the Kelsey F factor emerges again. But also, you know, it's just room for growth for guys like Xavier Worthy, and, you know, weirdly, we've kind of seen Noah Gray out there a lot. And he's growing in his role there, too. He's got nine targets across the games. He's taken eight of those receptions, too. So he's, he gets a little bit of space. He makes the play. You don't need more than that. He doesn't need to be a 25, um, you know, 25, 30 target a month guy. He's just had nine targets this month, and he's been effective with them. So, you know, that's the most Andy Reid thing in the world is to just take what you've got and, and make it work for you. So it's October. It's early October. And then when you look around the AFC South and the AFC East of who the Chiefs might play in a playoff, even if they don't win the division, which is incredibly unlikely, who are they facing when they do win the division and they're at a, a home final in the first week of the playoffs? Who who at all worries you 
in in the AFC who isn't a division winner for them and to that's face the next in their question, first week isn't at it? home. Right. We so know now gonna, all of a sudden yeah. we're putting him in the in yeah. the divisional round straight away. Yeah, they're going so they're gonna get out of the division with the, with the first first yeah, come first in that division. So one through four somewhere in that in the yeah. AFC, and then you've got to start asking the question of who who is they going to face in the AFC? Who do we feel really think even in those other four the other three out of those top four? Um, let's say all those one seeds are all going to be the yeah. best ones there. Who who else are we thinking about that could even be up there that could be a problem for them? You know, yeah. Houston Ravens Pittsburgh, will win the division, Buffalo, so Pittsburgh. Ravens, yeah, who knows? Like we think Bills will probably win the division. So who's next in the AFC East? And that's right. So <laughs> um, if the Texans win the a- AFC South, who's next? I mean, th- these are not world-beating teams, and they're going to have to travel to Kansas to play Andy Reid <laughs> in Kansas. We've seen this movie before. You know, it's just, yes. th- th- there isn't a team that I could put there who I'm worried about. Likely, likely after lose a, a buy, Island game. likely yeah. after a buy as well, because they'll get first round off. Because no doubt, at some point here, they're going to end up with a one seed in the AFC. Because look at the rest of the AFC. So, but even do if that. they didn't, I don't think it would matter. No, I don't think so either. You know? I think. It, we we saw last year did it, a cold weather game didn't even matter. They were third seed last year and they just brushed aside the coldest Miami game team ever. Who five minutes before could have been the second seed. You know what That's I mean? Right. Just because the way their division was set up, so it's just and, and, it, it doesn't that matter was, to them. That was the coldest game ever, and they still yeah. managed to figure out a way to to win that. So, yeah. how about so, another you know. AFC? How about another AFC team, Matty? Uh, Let's do it, and we'll go to the AFC East. Ha. The fairy tale is it over for the Jets after a disappointing loss to the Denver Broncos? None other than Bo Nix and the Denver Broncos beat the New York <laughs> Jets in what was a a defensive showing that Bill Belichick would have been proud of this week. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> the question here is just: you've got a team who are supposedly meant to be offensively more together. And they can't score a touchdown. I know playing in Denver is is one thing, but you're, you're playing at home. Are you talking about? Denver. That's right. And we're talking about future Hall of Famer Aaron Rodgers can't score a touchdown against no. the the Denver Broncos. Uh, and admittedly, I mean, it's we say that against the Denver Broncos, the Broncos, the weak part of the Broncos is the offense, which is astounding that they still won this game. But yeah. And, and the Bo Nix was the only one to score a touchdown. Um, the the Denver defense, though, they were on point in this yeah. game to to hold these Jets. But what happened to the New York defense? What happened to the Jets defense? They it didn't seem like they turned up for this game to to let this absolute rookie who looked woeful in real play in real time. He, what did he throw? He what, just, sixty yards. Come on! Yeah. It's not like the Jets defense was bad. It was the Jets' offense that was bad. I'm but not going to have anyone besmirch but, the Jets' defense in this. They held them on one touchdown, 10 total points. How many games are you going to lose with 10 points on the board, Ian? I don't no, know, but I was, just, I was trying to make the point that Bo Nix, <laughs> Bo Nix still does not look comfortable as an NFL oh, he quarterback. Sucks. He straight sucks, and that's fine because he's played like six minutes of NFL football. He's barely yeah. played more NFL football than you and I, Ian. So fine. Like, I don't care if he sucks. But the defense did a good job looking after a quarterback who's not ready for that kind of responsibility on the road to win these games. And Rogers' offense lost their way and couldn't get back on track. And I'm not going to lord Bo Nix for a well game game well played. He he wasn't good. Oh my no. god, he was not good. Uh, but I get why people are like, "Hey, good on you getting this win." It was a tough win because he still walks away with the the W in the column as a starter, and and that's like a, a career win for him. In the yep. same way that Aaron Rodgers got the career win after playing three snaps of the first game last year, yeah. um, <laughs> he gets a win for that. So it's it's the stupidest stat in sport, but. Uh, it, it, that offense has really lost its way, and you'd think that it should be better positioned because Garrett Wilson is an excellent wide receiver. He has had 1,000 yards receivers with the garbage men throwing him balls. Um, so you'd think future Hall of Famer should be working better for him than it is. And even then, a guy like Lazard, he you've got such a, a long history with, and a fellow like Mike Williams, big body bloke who you and I could get a short pass to in traffic. No worries, because he's a big body guy, and he's six foot a million. Um, and just none of these things seem to be helping. And, and between Brees Hall... And Braylon Allen, they racked up about 20 yards between them. It was just a, just an abhorrent display of offense. Awful. Yeah. Brees Hall has not looked good so far this season. I think that for, for moments he's looked good. But he definitely looks a, a step slow, I want to sort of say. 
Like yeah. it just it doesn't seem like the Brees Hall we saw early on last year. Um, it just there's there's something different going on there. And there's something different with that whole offense, and and it is it does start raising the question: is is there a deepening rift? Are we starting to see a deepening rift between Robert Sulla and his star quarterback? Because there have been there have been whispers, and there's also been some things that you can see in vision on the sideline and stuff that. It doesn't look like they're getting along, and, and Aaron Rodgers no. has been known to not get along with people when they're they're really not <laughs> doing the the what he considers the right thing for yeah. the team at that point. He he can be a bit um, he likes it his way. He and does. <laughs> the coach is ultimately the one who's going to lose their job before Aaron. So I can see why the coaching is like, well, we're going to do it our way. Um, and so when you got to, this is uh, an old rugby league saying of like, if you've got two guys in your line running different directions, you've got a problem, right? And there's, you can't have guys misaligned in the leadership structure of your team. It creates problems. There's two people going different directions here. And I mean, do I think the playoffs is a lost cause for this team? No, because we just presented the AFC case, right? Who in this division is likely to challenge them for the second place in the division? Miami can't beat a bar stool. And I mean, how much faith are you putting in anything New England, right? It's th- th- I-, I don't think there's another contender in this division. So now you've got to start looking around the conference at who else might knock them out of a seventh place. Uh, them getting to the playoffs, I don't think, is an impossible feat. And uh, It's just that they really need to get their ducks in a row soon before that does sail. And especially if these two are working in different directions. Well, you know Salah's going to be gone first. And then Roger's going to be gone pretty soon after because he's forty years old with a you know coming off an Achilles. So like he's not going to be around for another three years. He's, yeah. He might have next year. That, that well, this is it. A, it's a it's a it's a one it's a one year win at all cost season really, isn't it? So right. they're going to swing for the fences in whatever way they can. Yeah, and I mean the only thing that would bring Rogers back next year is his own ego. It's not because of a good business decision. It'd be you know what would bring him back. It'd be the Tom Brady effect. You win, you go out there and win the Super Bowl like Brady did with Tampa, and then you come back thinking you can do it all again. Oh god, yeah, it's a long way to think he can win the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, I know. So that but that would I'm, be. I'm more... worried about him winning a playoff spot at the moment, and there's seven of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that's where I'm at. <laughs> Most of us here at, at Good Acre Nine, so Brad Nick and, my, and yeah. myself, uh, did have. The Jets squeaking into the playoffs in the AFC at seven. Um, I'm okay but, with that. <laughs> but they were fighting against some other quality teams, some other teams now that are absolute quality, and, and the Commanders being one of them. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm well, not and a contender Sorry, like Miami uh, not being a threat anymore is another yeah. reason we go. Well, that ups the Jets, right? Because there's just one other person in the division there, like not like a lose twice to. You know, it's just that kind of yeah. thing. Sorry, I meant Pittsburgh, not Commanders in this one. But yeah, um, yeah, we we had them fighting against against the Steelers. To, to get into that seven spot, and it's just crazy. And I agree. Yeah. At the start of the season, that's the right call. Now, it's like, well, they might still be fighting with Pittsburgh, but for different reasons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, Brad did pick the Jets to be to, to win this division, which oh seems God, like Brad. a wild concept now. But you yeah. never know. You never well, know. it seemed wild know. then, too. But at least he could have some... Like, no one had lost a game at that point. Now we've actually got some data. You go. That, that's a that's a that's an outrageous call. <laughs> well, it, it seemed wild. It actually seemed wild because of this next team that we're going to talk about, mm. which is the Bills. The Bills had been playing amazing until this week against the Ravens, where suddenly yeah. it seems like the Bills' offense were not quite ready for prime time. Maddie, overreacting, overreacting. I mean. It's difficult, right? Because you're not going to play the Jags at home every week. Or Arizona, right? So this is two of their three wins. And they've not wowed me. But, I mean, I'm happy to say they're the best team in the division. But maybe now, all of a sudden, that's not saying a lot. Because of what we just spoke about with the other three teams in the division. So the other thing that gives me a little bit of pause about immediately going, oh, they're not ready for prime time, they're not ready for prime time, is that they're the top-scoring offense in the league still. You know, I, I, I think that still matters. It shows that they're... Their ability to score points is there, and it's whether their defense is able to stop things or not. They kind of got their the Dallas, the, the you know the Dallas problem of they're just going to have to outscore you. We we're not expecting their defense to do amazing things, but they should just be doing enough to restrict teams. And Allen yep. should be able to do enough. He doesn't have any big superstar ego. He's got to contend with now, so he can sprinkle it around where it needs to go, and he doesn't have to feel like he's got to play hero ball or constantly feed the you know the A type personality on his team who's all needy about stats and numbers and selling merch. So. Look, there's things there that I think we see one bad week in prime time on the road against a big AFC contender, 
and everyone thinks they know a lot from that. And I'm not sure that they know as much as they do because they're throwing out the previous three weeks where they've still been one of the highest scoring teams and every week isn't the pressure of what you get when you go on the road to an exceptionally good team in your conference. You get those games three times a year. Then you get them in the playoffs. You know, you're, as a top team in a conference, you're allowed to lose three games, four games. You're allowed to. You're just allowed to lose them. People will critique the shit out of you for doing it, but you're allowed to. No one gets to the playoffs 16-0. That's right. Absolutely. Right. It doesn't happen anymore. It's too no. hard. It's too hard. And 12-5 oh, is a great year. It's just that five sounds like a lot of losses now. Yeah, it does. Yeah, well, it does, actually. That's our well, problem. But, just, but, we think five is a lot of losses. It's not really. But it's not, won it's not really. There, there can be so many so many teams on 12-5. and five. Um, Yeah. So. Uh, righto. How about... <laughs> I want to quantify. There is one more reaction. You ch- you chucked yeah. a reaction at me early, an overreaction. Yeah, at me yeah. Earlier. Now I want to I want to quantify Maddie's overreaction before we get there. Maddie C is a perennial 49ers hater. He hates all things to do with San Francisco <laughs> oh, and, and culture. Ever. Loves loves to stir their fans constantly. Oh. So we have to get that out of the way before we say Eagles is West. the ed- is the NFC West the worst division in football? Overreacting. Overreacting. <laughs> massive overreaction, Matty. I'm it's, glad it's you put massive, this in, though. <laughs> it's a massive overreaction. When we have when the NFC South and uh, it, when the NFC South and the AFC South exist in our world, this is a massive overreaction. Is it though? Is it? I get, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. The, the 49ers are now at 2-2 two and two, um, yeah. after a win this week. Uh, the Seahawks are at 3-1. and one. I, I wouldn't have... I wouldn't, going into Monday Night Football, the way this year has gone, I wouldn't have been surprised if the Seahawks had gotten a win out of that and the Seahawks and yeah. the Chiefs and the Vikings were at 4-0. and oh. I wouldn't have been surprised at all. It, it just... It, wouldn't have, the way this year has gone, it just wouldn't have surprised me. But the Seahawks are at three and one, leading this division, and the Cardinals, who we thought were going to be amazing this season with Kyler Murray back and all these offensive weapons, are at one and three. Yeah. Uh, and the Rams, oh my God, the Rams have been snake bit. I swear to God, I swear it's not just now that they won a Super Bowl and they they sold their souls for a Super Bowl. We're a few years removed from that now. Yeah, but it seems like. They, they really made a deal with the devil at that point. At the crossroads, someone stood there and made a deal with the devil. And everything <laughs> after that is just going to be, he owns your soul. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And, like, so there was this wonderful thing where they just invested in the aging veteran who was really on top of their game, who was willing to take under-market money to just go there and do that. Um, and this is kind of, that's what goes around. This is what yep. comes around, and you're not dealing with this, you know, young spry quarterback. You got Matt Stafford, who's 150 years old, and he's throwing as many touchdowns as intercepts now, and he's playing with a reduced core of people because, well, it's a game of collisions and people get hurt, and now they don't have the depth because they've just spent all of their future money and future effort in draft picks on guys who they've already got the juice out of, and now here they are starting from zero. This was the first time they had their own first round pick in the longest time. Since I was a kid, and I'm pretty old, the this is you know you reaping what you sow is now you have to start again, and it's a pity because without the injuries, I really did think that the Rams were going to have the same thing as, as Dallas and Buffalo, where I don't trust their defense one lick, but I do think that they could score points, so I was okay with them still being compelling and interesting and maybe competitive, um, and them in San Francisco having double digit wins, I was cool with that. That's not the news we've got now, right? It, the plane's taken off and we found this turbulence ahead and you have to be allowed to make uh, an adjustment for the new news, right? So the new news is the Rams are sucking, really sucking, and yep. it will be shocking, but they may end up with a five or six win season and they may well just be picking right at the high end of the draft and looking for a coach. It could happen. That might be the trajectory we're on. Um, and it's just so different from five weeks ago when, depending on who you spoke to, maybe these guys were a shake to win the division. Yeah. Mate, I, I do have to agree with you in all that. It, the, the, is, it the worst, uh, is it the worst one is probably an overreaction because there are some out there that you could arguably say are equal with or if not worse. Um, but I guess we need a few more weeks before we really shake all that out. If they're still doing this bad, if this division is still like it is in, let's yeah. say, another four weeks and we get to that week eight, 
then you know what, Matty? I'll chuck it back into the overreaction segment to go. <laughs> Matty was correct. The <laughs> NFC West you- is the worst division in football. The, right there's a now. level of 49ers hate that's in this. Yes, admit it. But like, so the Seahawks four and zero. They uh, sorry, the Seahawks three and one. The, the one challenge they've had this year. Well, they scored twenty nine points, but they trailed that whole thing. They were never in charge of that game. And then both the Rams and the Cardinals stink, and the 49ers are just looking like the 2017 Jags, where if the defense isn't up, then Bortles there is just throwing to Alan <laughs> Hearns and, and all these guys you don't know or care about, and they're not good. They are, they are this close from being a shitty bad football team, and if their defense isn't really up, then they are a shitty bad football team. But fuck me, you'd think the 49ers were the best team on earth, and, and they aren't. They really aren't. They had to beat the shit out of New England this week, just gone, to have more points scored than against. Like, it's th- this is why I think the division is not what people think it is. Yeah. I do I do get bored with ragging on 49ers players um, oh, a lot. I don't. I, I get bored with it after a while. <laughs> I know you don't. I get it. But after a while, the, the, the football media, the NFL media – Make it so easy to do it because this week there was there was talk that Brock Purdy is playing amazingly and he's he's doing so well and look at him he's just carrying this team on his back. But the vision they showed was Brock having to escape the pocket and run around like a madman before throwing a ball wildly downfield, yeah. and it reminded me of someone else that plays in red. And it's Kyler Murray. And I thought, what this guy, he's running around like Kyler Murray, but that's not his game. That's Kyler yeah. Murray's game. You expect that out of Kyler Murray, and everyone has since day dot, but not out of Brock Purdy. And I'm like, how can you say he's playing well when all he's doing, having to do is run for his life to make a play and then, I don't know, losing to, to the a, Vikings? An unscripted or, play. Like, this is the thing. Like, or, he's, he's off script because the offense can't do it. And Mr. Self Aware, Trent Williams. Goes in a holdout all preseason. He's thirty six years old, holding out to get more money. Just yep. completely unaware you've heard of the damage he's here. doing to the team. The and lack of preseason. One or two guys down on that line. It will always show up, and there's been nothing but noise from the Bay all off season. The same way we had nothing but noise the year after the Eagles won the Super Bowl way back when, and then yes. the next year they underwhelmed massively. These guys didn't even yes. win the damn Super Bowl, and they're playing games through the regular season like. Like it's Super Bowl, they get to a lead, and then just the plates start to wobble, and things shake, and and they just look all out of sorts. And Purdy is off script, and and that is not how they will be successful. You can do that with Murray because he will make it happen, and he's used to that. He's been part of a terrible franchise for a long time, where sometimes they've got it together for a while. Purdy is used to being part of a well greased machine, and that machine has been squeaking and cracking and and spluttering all off season. And he yep. is not the truck. He is the trailer. Everybody has heard me say this. And you get guys in red coming and go, oh, yeah, yeah, Brock, Brock Purdy is fantastic. He isn't. And it's 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 really coming to roost. And it's, it's difficult for him to accept. He's not terrible, but he's not fantastic. He is mid-level quarterback. And that's where I'll just yeah. keep going. That's all he's shown as mid-level quarterback right now. And there's, but there's yeah. plenty of him doing it. But... He's longer than that. You can't put him on the upper echelons of QB. That's all no, I no, keep getting at. He's Bortles. He's fine when he's got a good defense. <laughs> I love the Bortles reference. To, yeah. to, <laughs> you using the Bortles reference on the fantasy show constantly, it just it cracks me up every day. Yeah. It'll be a feature <laughs> all year long. A feature. I know it will be with you. That's the best part about it. Um, <laughs> all right. Thank you for indulging I... me on that, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> I know, I do, and I don't want to. I, Manjot's going to be rolling his eyes, just going, "Oh, Ian and Maddie just attacking 49ers again." But no, Nick's going to hate it. Brendan Long's going to hate it. Like everyone, all these guys, Jackal from the uh, Astro League and Joel from the Astro League, going to hate it. There's so many of them. Be surprised how well Nick takes it. To be honest, oh, he's, <laughs> he's going to hate working with me on Saturday after he, he hears this. We, we're talking again on Saturday because he's doing the starts of the week with us for the fantasy show, and he's. I'm wondering if he's going to talk to me. That's going to be the question. <laughs> He will. will he decline the invitation? <laughs> Nick, Nick takes it. Nick takes it well. It's okay. I think. I mean, I don't care if anyone shares the strips off my Jags. I'm, I'm fine with it. It's fine. No, when I do that too, people try and rip the Vikings. <laughs> I'm like, eh, it is what it is. You can't hurt me more than my team has. <laughs> From Minnesota, man. Like it's... <laughs> You know, get, there's actually just, nothing even attractive about the town my team comes from. Not even the football team is unattractive, but the actual town itself is also a I mean, horrible, horrible pit. Your quarterback's pretty attractive, so you've got to at least no, go with that. He's got better hair than I'll ever have. 
That's right. He's got more hair than I'll ever have. <laughs> That's for it. fucking sure. Know, if you add up all your beard, I reckon you're getting close. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a quick break from this madness. And when we come back, we will be right into deep into the mailbag overreactions. And of course, g'day AI. Football fans across Australia and beyond, get ready for a brand new thrill in the world of American football. Aussie Gridiron today. The latest and greatest show from the Aussie Gridiron Network and Pastry Press NFL. Hosted by the dynamic duo of American football commentary, Manjot Melly and Matty Connor, this show is set to bring you the very best of Australian gridiron action every single week. Aussie Gridiron Today isn't just a show, it's a journey into the soul of Australian gridiron culture. We're here to tell the stories that matter, highlight athletes who inspire, and bring the excitement of American football to fans all over the world from right here in Australia. Aussie Gridiron today. Find us on YouTube every Wednesday at Pastry Press NFL with thanks to the Aussie Gridiron Network. All right, welcome back. Uh, Back again. Guess who's back? Maddie's back. Uh, he's still here. I've chained <laughs> him to the wall. Um, we're going to throw him some lotion, and we're going to reach deep into the mailbag, Maddie. And I say deep because we've only really got uh, we've only got we got one big one that I want to go over okay. this week. Yeah, the others were all in amongst our other reactions. Oh, cool. uh, yeah. Nick did throw out one, and I'm sorry, sorry, Nick, but I have lost it somewhere, and I'm trying to find it, but I haven't been <laughs> successful so far. Um, but I, I think Nick will get his reactions in. I think it was about a coach being fired before somewhere else. I feel like it was Sirianni, and that's we already talked about that yeah, earlier. Yeah, I so, think that's a problem. Uh, Matty, I did get a bit of an overreaction from somebody you may know. So this guy had already been banned okay. from the Aussie NFL fantasy show. He's on house arrest, I've been told, and uh, he's just hanging out at home, clearly watching the NFL and just screaming these these brilliant takes into a a nothingless (laughs) void. Um, So he's been been sending me some takes week in, week out now. So I thought maybe we'll read one of them out because one of them was so crazy that it definitely needed to go into the overreaction segment. Oh, and it, if listeners don't know who I'm talking about, then you should. If you've listened to the Aussie NFL fantasy show over the last couple of years, this is yeah. of course Doctor Good Call, who has I knew it was sent me guy. through stuff. That guy, I can smell um, it. He's <laughs> clearly just <laughs> yelling into a void. All these takes, just frustratingly, because he's not allowed on the show anymore, Matty. Yeah. Uh, and he's throwing me out one. Nico Collins is the best wide receiver in the National Football League. Overreacting. Overreacting. I'll play it again. Overreacting. (laughs) Overreacting. (laughs) That's right. That deserves a double stand drop. Um, Oh, my God. The best. Ah, Just like last week when Manjot decided to tack on on some superlatives to the end of his uh, overreaction. Dr. Goodcall has gone with Nico Collins. Uh, Nico Collins has been amazing. The connection with CJ Stroud is is undeniable. They just seem to... Stroud can just throw a ball downfield knowing that Nico is down there somewhere and uh, he ends up with it. Yeah, it's almost like the Baker-Mike Evans thing from last year. It's kind of cool. Oh, yes, but, absolutely, um, yeah. And I, thank, thank you I've for bringing up Baker on. Mayfield on my oh, yeah, podcast. I know. Yeah, brother, I've got you. I've got you, mate. I know. You scratch an itch. Yeah, mate, you've got to give the people what they want. <laughs> the the thing about Nico, and I've I've had to eat some humble pie on this because, like, I I really didn't think it was Nico. I thought it was likely to be Diggs then Nico, just on pedigree and and, and experience. And um, I had reasons why I thought it was likely to be Diggs really is the, the leader of this offensive, um, the wide receiving core over in, in Houston. But um, it, it's shown up to be Nico, and, and I'm 100% happy to be wrong about that because I think you're in one camp or another, and, and it's fine. Like, we're not... No one's saying Nico is shit. But what 
I think I've got to accept is that maybe Nico Collins is Andre Johnson. Maybe he just is. Andre Johnson back <laughs> again. Um, I loved Andre Johnson. He used to terrorize the Jags twice a year. And he'd go out and throw up 150 receiving yards, or he'd have a day where he'd have shorter yardage, but he'd get two touchdowns or whatever. And he just drove me crazy because of how down good he was. And it was hard to hate him. It was hard to hate him the same way I found it hard to hate Peyton Manning, even though same thing. He would terrorize my team twice a year. Um, and there's just kind of respect for game, right? Um, and, and I've just come to the point where I've just got to accept, actually, Nico Collins is a really good receiver, and I'm okay with that. And I was just wrong, and it's okay. But he's not the best receiver in the NFL. There is absolutely no chance he's the best receiver in the NFL. And I, I think, don't think you have to look too far to have guys who would throw up their issues with it as well in terms of, you know, well, what do you do with a guy like... Jefferson or Devontae Adams or, you know, well, Tyreek yeah. Hill's missing a quarterback now. But even then, I think, Ian, if you were given a few snaps under center, you just launch that thing downfield and get Tyreek to chase it. Like, I, I think there's guys who would have their issues yeah. with this. C.D. Lamb is another I mean, one. Jamar an Chase. Jamar Chase is coming issue. on song. So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, Nico Collins, probably solid number eight, eight out of ten, I'd say. Put him in that bottom of the top ten range. I'm cool with that. But I, I don't yeah. know that you can start making a conversation where he's... He's hitting uh, those high, high notes yet. And I mean, I'm not saying he can't. I'm just saying yet. Yep, that's right. Uh, so, of course, week after week, if you want to give us your overreactions, just like Dr. Goodcall has, uh, and rather than just scream <laughs> them guy. into a nothingless <laughs> void, uh, hit us up on Instagram or on any of our social media. I'll put up a post after Tuesday's game each week S- just Shout out for your overreactions, and uh, you can do that. Where can you find our Instagram, Maddie? Where do you find all of our stuff for the Aussie Gridiron Network? Oh, mate, the mothership, right? We've been calling it on the mothership because everything is there. It's all in one spot. Linktree forward slash Aussie Gridiron Network. Not only will you find everything for this show, you'll find everything that you need to get involved with our tipping contest. You'll find everything you need to catch up with the the fantasy stuff. You'll find Manjot there with Pastry Press NFL and his new YouTube show, Aussie Gridiron Today, which is featuring American football played here in Australia by Aussies. It's freaking cool. Everything is there. Linktree forward slash Aussie Gridiron Network. Thank me later. And this is what this is why Maddie's the host of a show. See the way he just <laughs> pulled that out off the cuff. I just didn't even set him up. I just didn't even tell him I was going to do that. And then there he goes. It's exactly right. Find all of that, all of our <laughs> stuff there. Great, great stuff. Great, great content. Uh, please just follow along and um, yeah. Buy merch. There. there is so much cool merch. Oh, there's so much cool merch and more cool so merch to cool come. Merch. I have so many. Stupid ideas every day oh where God. I forget to tell Maddie. Um, you know, like, <laughs> hey, Maddie, what if we can do this? What do we do this? Um, I'd probably be annoying the crap out of him day and day. But there's already some awesome, awesome merch up there, especially G'day Gridiron merch. There is some really cool designs that you can just – family-friendly yeah. ones you can buy for your kids. Um, and mascot have them. ones are great. They're so yeah. great, the mascot ones. Shout out to and Tom, have, by the way, for those. They are fantastic. Oh, shout out to Tom for a lot of things, to be honest. Tom is, yeah. And he's he's doing amazingly with uh we're in a very small family right now too. A very new small family. Good so job. Good on shout you, out to Tom. Um Righto, Maddie. We are at our new segment. Are you ready for it? Are you ready? <laughs> oh, mate. I I'm as ready as I'm gonna get. All right. Well, you ready for this? Let's start the day. Yes, of course, it is G'day AI, the new segment that is taking over the podcasting airwaves where <laughs> we ask AI for the top five storylines from the week that has just gone. We have talked about a couple of these already because, you know, Maddie yeah. and I are just so good like that. We are on the pulse, <laughs> fingers on pulse. Um, number one. Yeah. And this happened just in the last couple of days, and it is going to be a massive storyline over the next couple of weeks as we approach the trade deadline. Devontae Adams requests a trade from the Las Vegas Raiders. Of course, he didn't play last week in a narrow victory uh, the Raiders had against the Browns. I say narrow. They demolished the Browns for a good period of that that uh, that game. And, yes, sir. Um even guys like our mate Big Kev can't deny that uh, our amazing 
Gardner Minshew played really, really well in that game. Again, um, just a bit of a stab for Kev, who's been having a stab at both Maddie and I over Gardner Minshew and whether or not Aiden O'Connell should come in there. Uh, no, the answer is no. Um, <laughs> but of course, Devontae Adams has expressed his desire to be traded. Yep. He missed that game during due to a hamstring injury, and I'm putting mm. that in inverted quotes. Um, he's recorded 18 catches, 209 yards, one touchdown this season. Potential trade destinations, Matty? Who do you think might want to pick up Devontae? Oh, man. Do you know how many places I saw through the last 24 hours who were like, oh, God, imagine if he went to the I'm Chiefs. Guessing, hang on, let me think. There's 32 teams. The Raiders are one, so that leaves 31. So 31 other destinations? Is that what you've seen? Mm-hmm. No, no, I've seen about four. Because, uh, <laughs> um, like, I don't think there's any realism in the in the Chiefs one, but I've seen people talking about it because how compelling and fun is that? I, I don't think it's a real destination. I, I, yep. I want to say, out of the gate, there is zero, zero chance that he ends up on a team in the division. That That is just a zero chance. So whatever is in people's minds around that, you can throw that out. And then I think remotely more possible but still super unlikely to an AFC rival. This is a team who, they're not out of it, so they still have aspirations to make it to the playoffs, and they're not going to trade him to someone who could be winning games in a place where they could be winning games and jeopardize fair. the Antonio yeah, Pierce fair. trajectory, right? Because even without Devontae Adams, Antonio Pierce has got a job to do, and he can't tank it. He has to show progression, right? So he can't be sending Devontae Adams into the AFC, in my opinion. I just don't. I just can't imagine that that is... A good business decision for him. And this is a man who is all about identifying business decisions. Which leaves me now with... Okay, so there's a whole West full of guys. um, And then you've got to start ruling out teams that just simply can't afford it. San Francisco 49ers can't afford to buy their team lunch. Um, There's there's a few teams like that in the the NFC at the moment. Um, The Rams are in kind of a bit of salary cap hell. So then when the names that come up, places like the Saints... Well, I'm not sure that the connection with Derek Carr is what you can hang the hat on there. Mm. I can see them saying, we've got money, we've got an opportunity, our team ain't shit in a division that could make the playoffs. I can see that. Um, but yeah, I, I think it narrows it down a bit. Who have you got as a top couple of destinations, Ian? Uh, top of that list, actually, and I agree with the NFC, um, it, it, weirdly, it would be, now that they're at 3-1, and one, would be the Washington Commanders. I wonder yeah. whether they might they might take a swing. Of course, they've got Scary Terry, and Terry McLaurin is uh, amazing. It has been for many, many, many years. And yep. he will continue to be for many, many, many years, knowing Terry McLaurin. Um, Good play. But could you imagine Devontae Adams on a team with Jaden Daniels? It's just, I mean, as a, as a football okay. fan, you can, sal- you can salivate at that, really. Just yep. how that team could get better. Now that they're 3-1, and one, maybe they, they win another couple of games and they take a go, oh, you know what? We could actually have a really deep run here and take a swing at it. Yeah, um, I, I don't think that's an unreasonable suggestion because that they are set up still to, to backfill it. They've got mm. picks and they've got money. So they're, they're set up to backfill it. And Devon Adams, he's not retiring anytime soon. The other one is probably oh, maybe the 49ers. Does he make the 49ers better? Can they afford him? Because, of course, they've been I think at that's the, 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 question. The, it's money. The, the top end of the league for a, a while now. And they've got to be able to afford both the money and the uh, compensation to, in a trade. I wonder whether maybe back, going backwards to come forwards, going back to the Packers. That's also come up too. And, and I think that's a really compelling one. I, I feel like there's a real likelihood that that could come off. And and it's two things, right? I think it's that there's a there's that nostalgic thing about being in the, the green and gold again for Devontae himself in a team who aren't bad. Um, people can say what they like about the Packers, whether they love them or hate them. I don't think they're a bad team. Their defense has certainly been showing up. Um, and that gives Devontae Adams as good a chance as anywhere else in the NFC to go to a team who should have playoff ambitions, very solid playoff ambitions, and know that they can win playoff games. Because we've yep. already seen it, and adding Devontae Adams is not going to make them less likely to do that. So I kind of feel like, to me, that's the most compelling one. Yep, absolutely. I do too. Uh, the NFC is hard fought, so that's... For those, as we talked about earlier, the AFC, um, it might not be Top as Top heavy deep. and then a bunch of garbage. Yeah. But the NFC, yeah. there's a lot of teams in a crunch who are actually yeah. pretty good teams. And a lot of teams that could probably just take a swing to just add that one extra weapon that could really take you over yeah. the edge. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So second on the list is, is one we've already talked about. Uh, Broncos, winners, underdogs. Because, of course, we've talked about the Denver Broncos earlier. Uh, 
that's one of the big talking points this week. Number three, Maddie. Number yeah. three on the list. I'm gonna I'm gonna do it to you as well. I've got this drop now, so we're just gonna oh, keep I like using this. it. Brad got right into it last week, by the way. He did, didn't he? Oh god, he was He was getting into it. Skull chant out, mate. Yeah. I feel like I'm gonna camera rate this game. We do this to the Canberra Raiders. Do you know that? The the green jersey NRL team? I know. I know. And I don't know who did it first, to be honest. Oh, Iceland. That's it's the Iceland. Raiders need the right the Raiders definitely need a Matterhorn, no. Um The Canberra Raiders, they need, they need a Matterhorn. I think that uh, would they, make... they could do a lot. But I I listened to a podcast this week, Ian, you're gonna hate this. But it described Vikings as actually okay, so when you go to Battle Vikings are savage, but you know what Vikings really are? They're fucking farmers. When when you hear Viking, you're supposed to think farmer. The hat with the horns never existed. We've made that up, and we've we, that's something that we've created later. That's yep. just a, a fallacy, <laughs> not historically sound at all. But ever since somebody described to me, actually, when you think Viking, you really should start thinking farmer. I've really thought differently about Minnesota and Canberra's football teams. I really have. It's messed <laughs> stuff up for me. Well, look at where look at where they are too. The Minnesota, Minnesota. farmers. <laughs> look at the, the Minnesota. It's farming country. Like That's it just it. is. Yeah. Um, and of course, point three, obviously <laughs> number three was two undefeated teams remain as a week four. The Minnesota Vikings, as of course we just got the skull chan and the Matterhorn. The Minnesota <laughs> Farmers and the <laughs> Kansas City Chiefs are the only yeah. two undefeated teams in the National Football League right now. So how long do we think they stay undefeated, Ian? Um, I mean, well, the the Vikings have got the Jets in London this this week, this yeah. week coming. Uh, that can and, be anything. Well, the Jets, uh, sorry, the Vikings have always performed very well in London, so it's a uh, it's looking good for. God, if for ever that. there was a week for the Jets to have a rocket up them though, after last week. Oh, my God. So you can't be looking True. at this as like it's going to be an easy one because, again, you never take the defense easily, but surely their offense is going to be focused. Yeah. Or oh, people absolutely. getting fired. One of the two. Absolutely, mate. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, the, the Vikings have always done very well in London, so yep. there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of hope. And you never know. They could just absolutely ruin the Jets' season and everything mm-hmm. that goes on with that franchise from here on out. Uh, the Chiefs, if anybody listened to our... Um, mm. Our predictions episodes. I famously had the Chiefs going uh, sixteen and zero. So, and then I <laughs> dialed that back slightly, ever slightly. so slightly, just to to. I think I had it at fourteen and two or fifteen and one. Um, yeah, yeah. Chiefs have got the Saints this week. Ooh, that could be tough. They have the Saints in in Kansas City, so they are at home. So um, I kind of feel like that's probably enough, right? It's probably just enough. Being at home is a big deal, right? And then they go to the West Coast, uh, 49ers, Raiders, mm. Buccaneers, Broncos. Oh, man. Right now, right now, the Chiefs, if the Chiefs actually play the way they have been to win games, to win a game, because that's the way they're yes. playing is to win a game, not just to look flashy. They're playing to dominate and win a game. Um, I think they can still, still keep winning. We, I don't know when we could. can see a Chiefs loss, to be honest. I think, I think we might not see it until they come up against the Bills. Uh, later on in November. And even then, Bills in prime time, right? We just had this conversation earlier. Oh, yeah, we did, That's yeah. a few weeks away, so the Bills have got some chance. But, I mean, they're still the highest scoring offense in the league. So, you know, the Chiefs all have their work cut out. But, yeah, it's like, so any day when the Chiefs are playing against anyone, you can always make the argument, well, the Chiefs could win that, right? Like, yep. it's much harder to make the case for the other team than just to go, well, Chiefs. Um, so I think that that can ride, but I mean, what we know about the Chiefs is, even last year where they went wind up with twelve and five, eleven and six, they're, they're susceptible to losing games, and it doesn't actually matter if they lose games. No, because once they get to the playoffs, it's switch flipping time, LeBron style, and it's a whole different world, and and the weather's different, and 
and their approach can can just be a bit more targeted at what you're weak at, and nobody's a greater exponent of these things than the Kansas City coaching staff. So yeah, it doesn't even matter in Kansas's long term how long they stay undefeated. No, we saw plenty of like Peyton Manning teams go 12, 13, and zero, and then just crash out in the first week of the playoffs in Baltimore in a game where they didn't even score a touchdown because Baltimore turned on the screws. I'm not so worried about that with the Chiefs because I don't care if they lose in the regular season. Yeah. I understand. So, uh, and when we are talking about that against about the Bills, so the Ravens make a statement against the Bills is ah. at four. The Baltimore Ravens uh, just d- dominated. We thought Kill this them. game would be a lot closer. I, we, I think a lot of the, the uh, NFL verse thought the Bills the way they had been playing, especially um, defensively and offensively, the way they attacked. You know, the Jags was a big thing. Yeah, they just just Kill destroyed them. the Jags. We thought that this game would be a lot closer. Ended up being. 35-10, the way of the Ravens, thanks to one, the King, Derek Henry, who had an incredible rushing performance for 199 yards on the ground. Um, and possibly the only thing wrong that the Ravens did in the entire game was at the end of the game where they decided to throw a failed screen pass to Derek Henry. And it's just like, what are you doing? The man is on 199. Give him the rock. And let him fucking run. <laughs> what what was that? What was that? And I mean, we've seen the Ter- Ravens a terrible, do this terrible play call. before where they just gave a guy the rock on like a play where you should kneel and run out of clock just to get a 100-yard rusher to keep a streak of 100-yard rushes going. We've seen how stupid statistical things are important to this same coaching team. And here like, they are going, oh, like you mean You mean whatever. a preseason winning streak? Preseason and winning is more of these <laughs> bullshit things that are important to the Ravens, and then they don't do that for the best rusher they've had in twenty years since like Jamal Lewis or whatever. It's it, it, it's madness to me. I don't know why you don't just give him the ball and, and make the old man happy. Why not? Um, needless to say, peeled off one hundred um, twenty of it in in all the carries afterwards after leaping on that. Like what was it? Was it eighty seven yards? Was that the touchdown yeah. run to start with? I mean, eighty seven. And he was running yards. away from the guys who were chasing. Him. Would, he still got I some would... speed once he gets to the top end. I wish we could get a bit of next gen stats going here because I would love to see what his speed was, his top speed yeah. at that point. Because uh, he I was think running Derek... away from the gap was only increasing. It was amazing yeah. to see because he doesn't even look like he's striding like that hard. He's just yeah, but it takes a long while to get up to that. But once he's going, bloody hell, I wasn't expecting that. Well, some people were saying he was too old to be playing this season, Matty, and he wasn't going to be that good. Yeah, I. I definitely didn't think he was going to have some the impact people, he's Some people in this room, by the way. Hey, some people in this room just said he wasn't going to score 12 touchdowns. Okay? That's uh, <laughs> looking like a pretty pretty rough bet. But <laughs> you, were um, calling, uh, you were calling him old man Henry at one point. So let's just... <laughs> he still is. He's still an old man. There's nothing I've said about a, that. That's not right. <laughs> he's a bloody good looking old man. <laughs> so am I, mate. I've got 10 years on that bloke. Don't look like Derek Henry, that's for sure. <laughs> no, there's slightly different hair. It's not the biggest difference, but, you know, it's one of them. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit of height there too, by the way. A bit of height, a bit about our appearance, a bit about our athleticism, a bit about our <laughs> careers. Um, he probably hasn't spent nearly as much time behind a desk managing apartment blocks as I have, so take that, Derek. You're not good at everything. Um, but, mate, he's definitely showing that he's he's got this role over in Baltimore and he's, he's going to fill it. Um, and, and I think the big tension point with where his role collides with Lamar Jackson's role was purely in fantasy, which is great because, you know, f- fantasy is not real football and real football is not fantasy. Um, but it was the contention that that would hurt Lamar Jackson and that they were going to be leading in games and how would this impact Lamar Jackson's fantasy life? Well, because Lamar Jackson's trailed so much in his career, like it's going <laughs> to, it's never impacted his ability to put up fantasy points and it still doesn't. So I guess that was kind of the, if you... It, we, it put us on islands of saying, well, okay, I'm going to talk this guy down because this guy's going to be successful and the other guy's going to talk the other person down because their guy's going to be successful. And actually, it turns out you can probably have both. It's like the old El Paso ad, ¿Por qué no los dos? Why don't we have both? <laughs> um, and it kind of feels like maybe that's what we're going to get and potentially it's the receivers who are going to kind of eat a little bit of the dirt sandwich instead and it's going to be on the ground. Yeah. The last of our five top five talking points, uh, according to G'day AI this week, Matty. And this was very cool. The nerds loved this. I know, absolutely. And I'm surprised this was not number one, to be honest. Um, I don't know what AI is it thinking. It was for Manjot. 
<laughs> this, this is not number one. Yeah, it definitely was for me. John. <laughs> it was Jared... agaped. He was just yeah. aghast. He ga- dropped your He couldn't believe this. Jared Goff sets an NFL record. Detroit Lions quarterback Jared Goff made history by completing all 18 of his pass attempts without an incompletion during Monday night's game against the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, the achievement set an NFL record for most completions in a game without an incompletion and contributed to, of course, his impressive stats of 292 passing yards, two touchdowns in a very, very commanding win by the Lions, 42-29 to over the Seattle Seahawks, Brad's second team. Um, <laughs> Matty, the, Jared Goff has just... Ever since he joined the Lions, it's just been up and up for Jared Goff as a person, as a player. Yeah, he's just like he's just like he's revered as a god in Detroit these days. He's the best thing that happened in Detroit since the Sweetness, right? Like that's, I think we can agree. Even Megatron, not as important to Detroit as Jared Goff, because I think Megatron needs supply. Goff is supply. Sweetness didn't need supply. He is supply. And, and and I think, you know, it was good that Megatron had Stafford to help build him. But Stafford was never to Detroit what, what Goff is to Detroit. And I love that. And I went back and forth on this, Ian. Do I give a crap this guy had no incompletions? Actually, I, do I you? actually don't think I do. I don't do think you I give care. A crap? I, don't think, if, I think if he was 18 of 19, 18 of 20, 18 of 21, I don't think I care. Um, I think that... If you're only going to complete 18 passes, complete 292 yards, win the game, running away, it's just a good day. And some statistical little weirdo anomaly that, okay, of all these completed passes, there wasn't even one that was, wasn't was incomplete. I don't care, because if one was incomplete, it still wouldn't make this day less impressive. I just, I just don't <laughs> care. And I know that sounds so heartless. <laughs> but, I mean, in, in the scheme of things, it really, it, I don't think it matters. But it's a cool, nerdy thing, and that's why I care. It is a cool, nerdy thing. Matty, I would <laughs> suggest that um, he's the best thing to happen to the city of Detroit since the Ford Motor Company. Fucking hell. That's, that's a big I, call. Would go, I would go that far. What we what we don't see in that stat, though, is one little stat line where there is a one reception for seven yards and one touchdown in what was an amazing play uh, that they have used before um, where Jared Goff... Uh, passed it to Amon Ra St. Brown, who then threw a touchdown pass to Jared Goff, who w- went straight into the end zone. He had to catch that over, like, a defender in his grill a bit, too. There was, uh, the, as the play developed, it, it's not like Goff just bubbled out and no one followed him. He then had, like, waving arms of defender facing him he had to contend with to watch that ball in. So, I mean... Even as a receiver, that's not the easiest thing to do. But as a quarterback whose job is not to do that, um, it only made the play more impressive. And I I've know, actually seen that. I've actually seen what you fucking have to be to not like Jared Goff. Because I know. if you if if you are that kind of robot, and then you saw this, and you still don't like Jared Goff, you 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 don't you just don't get to appreciate football the way everyone else does. Like you are missing out. I uh, I like Jared Goff, but I have seen that play design before. Uh, it didn't go so well. I actually saw it uh, in a Tampa Bay game with one Tom Brady who missed the catch. Dropped the catch. Yeah. Stone Cold dropped the catch and didn't get a TD in that way. Um, Jared Goff, on the other hand, knew where the ball was coming from and knew how to catch the ball once the ball was thrown. So, And God, doesn't he look good in those black and blue uniforms? Those alternate uniforms look amazing. I- I've heard people go both ways on this too, and I, I didn't care too much about the black and um uniforms but what i did like was the helmet i thought the helmet was pretty oh, yeah, neat pretty good um uh, the the rest i could take or leave but yeah the helmet i was really impressed with the helmet <laughs> i was impressed with a lot of this game actually um yeah david montgomery still showing up uh as yeah. an amazing player and, and an impact player and then it, it just, doesn't hurt gibbs who's also fantastic and montgomery Amara barnstorming well. over people is just was amazing as well just runs a man over just bosses just guys. I just runs a man over. Runs a man over, Betty. And this is what people in the NFL don't talk about a bit too. They were all focused on the bit where he absolutely poleaxed a guy like up front and just ran a man over. You and I and other Australians, as rugby league fans, yeah. may have noticed as he ran further down the field the stutter step as he was running. 
uh, you know, and it's just trying to to, it's to get to the defender the, off balance, make him think step, get that defender. Yeah, I know, and that's something we see regularly in the in rugby league from some very star rugby league players running what down the fields. So, um, there was been some great ones over the years that have that have used that to their advantage, and it, it was like a calling card. But yeah, There's just two watching teams who are about to who have great exponents <clears throat> of that about to play in that grand final this weekend in both Penrith and Melbourne, um, and I mean immediately drawn to their fullbacks, but also their wingers who are just great finishers as well. So it's it's, it's just something we see regularly because. To make a tackle in rugby league, uh, you actually have to bring the guy to the ground. It's not enough to just to bump him, get his knee or elbow to touch. You actually have to um, affect the tackle and hold the guy down. So it's it's a yep. different thing altogether, which gives a bit of advantage to the runner to muck around like that. You just don't kind of have that time in the NFL where generally that, you just kind of have to just outpace the guy or out like power him, and you don't get to mix it. So rugby league kind of gives right. you that yep. benefit. And I saw when I saw that's the bit I saw. It was like, oh, he ran him over. Oh, check out the step. And then look at the second oh, the level. Step. Yeah, yeah. As he was running, it's a step just threw the step Aussie in there. And perspective I'm like, perspective right there. Look out! Look out, Monty. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Yeah, um, I love right. Monty. He's great, and uh, and it was good to see Amon Ra, who has kind of been a bit up and down in terms of like, it, and again, the lens I see a lot of this through is fantasy, um, to be involved again heavily in the passing game finally and, and looking healthy um but the, the passing touchdown was something i wasn't expecting he had in his kit bag so that was nice i, I liked that yeah so did i i think a lot of people did yeah maddie that's the end of g'day ai for this week and of course that is the end of the overreaction show thank you very much for joining me maddie it's uh thank you it's been an absolute pleasure Mate, it's been my pleasure. We haven't done this often enough, so it's great to get the opportunity to help out and uh, and for you to suffer all my big loud takes and my hyperbole. I'm I'm so glad. <laughs> That's all right. It's the two hosts from the Aussie Gridiron Network on one podcast, uh, it's, it's where we're both trying to, to host the one show. <laughs> I know, but did you, did you notice that the one of us still hosts the show and the other one acts the fool when we're on that person's show? Yeah, uh, we know our roles, on, mate. We know our roles. Me, me on the fantasy show, I think it just every, everything least, goes mate. out the window. <laughs> just, yeah. It's like, you know, Maddie, it's your job to control me when I'm on your show. I'm like, fucking hell. <laughs> and it's a bit the same here. I'm like, oh, man, you're steering this thing. I just get to play. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. All right well, thank you for thank having you. me. It's been a real pleasure to be back on the GGs. Yeah, it's been great, mate. Great, great having you. Uh, and of course, you. make sure you uh, check out the mothership as we talked about earlier. Uh, Linktree forward slash Aussie Gridiron Network for everything to do with the Aussie Gridiron Network. Uh, all of our shows, our merch store, uh, absolutely everything, all of our socials. Please check that out. Uh, like and subscribe everywhere. Thank you very much for coming. And on behalf of Maddie and myself, see you later. Hooroo! The Giddy Gridiron Podcast is brought to you by the Aussie Gridiron Network, a network of gridiron content made by Australians for Australians. Check out our other programs, the Aussie NFL Fantasy Show, No Huddle Dynasty and Pastry Press NFL. And don't forget to like and follow us and the whole of the Aussie Gridiron Network on Instagram, Facebook and Pastry Press on YouTube.